Good to see all of you here today. I'd like to start out with the oldest story ever told in Genesis, how things were created. God created life. You know, in a, in a place like Florida, where life is all around us, we kind of take that for granted. And that's certainly how people in the past have done this. They have, uh, they have just assumed that life is abundant throughout the universe. <laughs> but we're told that it was only, life was only added here. God created plant life here. He created the sea animals and the land animals. And each time he did that, he did that each after its own kind. And then he created mankind. And mankind was special because mankind was made after the image and the likeness of God. Which meant that mankind had an awesome, wonderful potential. And God put something in man that he did not put into the other animals. And that was a human spirit. And this spirit gives mankind intelligence, creativity, and the ability to govern. All flawed. We're not, we're made after God, but we don't have the intelligence of God. Not yet. We don't have the creativity of God. Not yet. And we certainly don't have the ability to govern as God. <laughs> Not yet, but we do have that potential. God put two trees in the midst of the Garden of Eden, and it was a matter of life and death. The first tree was, was actually called the tree of life. Now this has to be different than just life, because they already had life in them. And they were actually allowed to eat of the tree of life. The second tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But God commanded Adam and Eve not to eat this tree. He said, if you do, you shall surely die. So what happened? They disobeyed God. And disobeying God is called a sin. They chose the wrong tree. They were put out of the Garden of Eden, and they were cut off from the tree of life. Eventually, they did die. But what happened after they died? What happened next? When I was in college, I asked some of my friends what they believed. I had Baptist, Methodist, Catholic friends in college. And I knew what I believed, but I wanted to know what they believed. And most believed two things. They believed that man was given an immortal soul, and that today was the only day of salvation. For them, when you died, you either went to heaven or you went to hell. Now, our Bible teaches us that there is only one name under heaven by which we may be saved. That's the name of Jesus Christ. Think about all of the people that have ever lived. Think about the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. Well, I mean, well, first of all, think about all the people that lived in the Old Testament. They didn't know the name of Jesus. And then as we fast forward, you had the Dark Ages where people couldn't read or write. And the Bible was only, if it, if it was it existed at all, it existed in Latin and was controlled by a very uh, elite group of priests that would not share that with anybody else. And then today we have billions of people in China that aren't allowed to read the Bible. If somebody were to be baptized in China, that would have to be a, a state secret. We couldn't tell anybody because they could be persecuted in their home country. So does this mean they're going to be condemned? What does this lead to? Well, people if, if people believe those two things, that we have an immortal soul and today is the only day of salvation, then it leads them to want to save everybody now. Thirteen months ago, there was a gentleman, his name was John Allen Chu, and he went to this island off of the coast of India. And this was, this was not a spur of the moment. Mr. Chu had been planning this for years. He had studied this island, had actually taken a trip years before to scout out how to get to the island. This island is cut off from the rest of the world. It's a tribe of native people, 
uh, they think possibly from Africa thousands of years ago that absolutely do not want any outside influence. These people are so anti-civilization that back in 2004, when the tsunami hit that area, they actually sent rescue helicopters over the island to see if anybody needed to be rescued. And the islanders shot arrows at the helicopter. They're like, stay away, we don't want your help. And then the fact that they're using arrows also tells you a little bit about the, the state of their civilization. So Mr. Chu, 13 months ago, goes to this island. First of all, the first day he got scared. He got he rode his canoe up to close to the island. He was going to offer them some fish. Now, he didn't know their language. They didn't know his. His plan was hopefully that they would let him live on the island for a couple of years and that he could eventually learn their language so he could preach the gospel to them and so they could be saved. First day, he chickened out, threw the fish at him, rode back to his support boat, which was a mile away. The second day, he's standing there talking to them. They're laughing at him. And a little kid shoots an arrow at him, ends up hitting his Bible. And once again, he takes off. This time, he had actually brought a bunch of supplies with him this time, including his passport. And because of the arrow coming at him, he lost his nerve once again. He took off running. He swam back to the boat. He didn't take his kayak, left his passport, everything else. The third day, he goes, okay, I've just got to be committed. I want you guys to drop me off and leave. Don't even be out in the ocean a mile away. Just leave, come back tonight. Yeah. When they came back the next day, they think, the fishermen think they saw the islanders with his body. They'd killed him. Yeah. He was described as a very passionate Christian. He had this goal. He had written a letter to his family right before this last day. And he says, this is not a pointless thing. The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand, and I can't wait to see them around the throne of God worshiping. For him, it was a matter of life or death right now. Is this God's plan? Is it hit or miss as to who gets saved? Are the people on that island now condemned to eternal damnation? Why don't you take a look at this pie chart? I'm being extremely generous here. This is everybody that has ever lived. And in the, in the white spot there, about 20% of the pie chart, is those that may have heard Jesus' name over the, over the course of history. The other 80% condemned, according to that common belief. You know, that's what I'm going to be talking about today is... Not only what we believe, but I'm going to dispel some of the things that creep in from other churches that creep into our church as well. So here it looks like the vast majority of everyone who has ever lived is going to be kept out of God's kingdom. So does man have an immortal soul? Is today the only day of salvation? And what does the Bible say about eternal life? I already knew what I believed, but when I was talking to my college friends, I don't think I convinced them very well. So hopefully I can give you a few tools today, um, picking up on your toolbox from last week. Hopefully I can give you a few tools today that you can give a better answer than what I gave. But let's first of all look at some of these fallacies. Does, the, does man have an immortal soul? Well, this one's easy, no. You can't find the phrase immortal soul anywhere in the Bible. Nor is the concept. We actually are repeatedly told the opposite. That salvation is a gift that has to be given from God. If we already had it, why would it need to be given to us? So what does happen to us when we die? I like to be shocking every once in a while. We go to hell. <laughs> Actually, Mr. Smith had said this to me last week, and I'm like, I want to add that. 
The word hell in the Bible, there's three words, and I'm only going to really cover the first one. There's three words translated hell in the Bible. The one that's translated hell most often is Hades. But when you look at the actual definition, it just simply means the ground, a grave, a place of death. Yeah, so, so, but you see, that's one of those things that creeps in from other religions. You know, I actually said this to Elisa on the ride here, and she said, oh, that hurts the ears to say we're going to hell. Because what do we know from other religions? Heaven is wonderful and hell is this fiery burning place, but that's not what the Bible teaches as what hell is. It's just simply the grave. So where do we go when we die? We go to the ground. I want to, my first scripture, let's hit the Bible now. Acts 2 and verse 31. And the reason I point this out is because it uses the word Hades here. In Acts 2, verse 31, the word he there at the beginning is referring to King David. Um, So there was a prophecy listed earlier in Acts, and um, Peter is, is saying this. He says, he, David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So... We take this simply because we know where Christ was. He was in a tomb for three days and three nights. So we take this simply to mean a place of death. But there are other religions that actually take this one verse and say that Christ went down into hell where Satan and the demons are and everybody that had been condemned up to that point and he preached to them. Now, you, that's a lot to read out of one word. Yeah. So even Christ simply went into the grave. A couple other scriptures I want to give you for reference. Genesis 3.19, In the sweat of the face you, are, uh, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. So this is right after Adam and Eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit. And God is pronouncing a curse on them and also telling them, hey, this is what's going to happen. He's telling them the future. So God himself says that what happens after death We go into the ground from which we came from. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are and dust you will return. This is repeated in Ecclesiastes 3.20. All go to one place. All are from the dust and all return to dust. Did I go too far? Oh, so Ecclesiastes 3.20 was there. And then our next one is Ecclesiastes 9.5. This also speaks to the immortal soul doctrine here. Ecclesiastes 9.5. For the living know that they will die. It's appointed to all men once to die. And if you've lived long enough, you've seen people die. So the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. And then down at the bottom here I have Ecclesiastes 12.7. Then the dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So we mentioned a spirit earlier, that a spirit in man, a human spirit, that gives us intelligence and creativity, that spirit returns to God. This spirit contains our memories, contains our personality. It does not have consciousness separate from the body, and that's a very important point. This spirit is not conscious in heaven. We are in the grave, and we know nothing. Many places in the Bible refers to death as sleep. Would it make sense to describe being in heaven as being asleep? Let's read part of Lazarus' story. Let's jump to John 11. John chapter 11, verse 11. Again, this is part of a a great story. I'm just breaking into the middle of it. I encourage you to go and read the entire passage. John 11, 11 says, These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death. 
But they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. In verse 14, then Jesus said to, him, uh, said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So very, I, I love it, and, and this is how we should always do it. Let the Bible explain the Bible. Let the Bible explain what it means so that we don't have to be confused as to what it means when someone is asleep in the Bible. It means they're dead, and that's where we're going to be. We're just simply going to be asleep. Lazarus didn't go to heaven. He was put into a tomb. We know this because Christ went up to it. He was already beginning to decompose. His sister said, whoa, he's going to be smelly. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, be careful when you roll that thing back. Mankind does not have an immortal soul. So let's move on to our next question. Is this the only day of salvation? And once again, this is a resounding no. And I'm going to show this as we go on. Let's continue on with Lazarus' story. Let's c skip down to verse 23. Verse 23, Jesus is speaking to Martha. And he says, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So this was something that was known. It was known that there was going to be a resurrection into, in the future. And the word resurrection simply means a rising again as from decay or a revival. So they knew that there would be a revival. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. And so as we go on in the next uh, sections here, we'll talk about different types of revivals, different types of resurrections. Um, so Christ says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, he just says life. And again, we already have life in us, right? We're breathing. We're standing here. We're talking. What did the philosopher say? I think, therefore, I am. So what life is he talking about? We'll clear that up in just a second. Continuing on in verse 25, He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. In verse 44, we read that Lazarus was resur resurrected back to physical life. And when we think about this, again, this concept was not a new concept, the concept of resurrection. There were actually three people in the Old Testament that were resurrected. There were five individuals in the New Testament that were resur resurrected, uh, that were named. And when Christ was crucified and resurrected, it said many saints came out of their tombs. But that was a resurrection to physical life. Those were all resurrections to physical life. They all eventually died a second time. Now, in verse 44, we'll go ahead and pull that up. This is where Lazarus actually came out. And so, he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with cloth, and Jesus said to him, let him loose, or loose him and let him go. Now, what if my college friends had been correct that when you die, you go to heaven? Lazarus would have been resurrected as a spiritual being. He would have been in heaven, and he would have seen God in all of his glory. And then Jesus yanks him back to the earth in a physical body. What a jip. <laughs> Wouldn't you be disappointed if you had finally got to see heaven? And they're like, no, no, we want you back down here for a while. So if this concept of an immortal soul was correct, and that when we die, we either go to heaven or hell. Now, maybe Lazarus went to hell. Maybe that's what they would say. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was happy to get back to earth. <laughs> Yeah, I think that would be, I wouldn't be too happy with Jesus. I'd be, I'd, hey, <laughs> I was already meeting the Father, <laughs> you know. You're great, Jesus, but I was meeting the Father. All right, so let's get back on, the po on point. The fact that Jesus needed to be resurrected is another point against mankind having an immortal soul. So let's look at God's plan and how this plan is completed through what Christ called a resurrection. So what is God's plan? John 3.16 should be a very well-known scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This, you know, this actually goes back to what we were just reading in John 11 when Jesus was talking to Martha. He says, who believes in him, Jesus, shall not perish but have everlasting life. So whereas Jesus said, he who believes in me shall have life, 
It's defined here as eternal life, not just breathing, talking, thinking. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is God's plan. Verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God's plan is for everyone to be in his family, to be in his kingdom. I want you to frame everything that I say from now, from the rest of this uh, split sermon, that God wants everybody into his kingdom, past, present, and future. So let me ask you, how's God's plan coming along? Actually, it's going pretty good, but you wouldn't know that by looking at the numbers. Let's look at the numbers. God wants everybody in his kingdom, right? Uh, okay. Right now, that's where we're at. <laughs> we got that white line right there. That's Christ, the firstborn. Nobody else, whoops, nobody else has actually achieved salvation yet. So if we're going by the numbers, the plan's kind of lacking. Uh, a couple of scriptures to help me with this. No one has seen God at any time. Only the begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared Him. And then Romans 8.29. For whom He had for, for knew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. I didn't realize I got a little bit cut off over here. I do have to narrow my margins. Okay. So, is God's plan failing? No, not so fast. There is more to the plan. And everything that I've said today has been leading up to this. Explaining the resurrections. I want you to work on memorizing the next three scriptural references. Actually, there's probably only two you really need to know. You don't need to know the whole scriptures. Just know how to get to them you will be able to give a better answer perhaps than what I gave to my college friends. The first passage of the three is 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. This is Paul, and he goes, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. And we know what that means. That means death. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. And you can reference, um, again, you, this is not one of the three you need to memorize, but you can reference 1 Corinthians 15. Actually, you could. This is actually the second one. But uh, specifically, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 19. Because Paul says here, if in this life only we have no hope, uh, I'm sorry, if, if this life only we have hope in Christ, then we are all men most pitiable or miserable. Continuing here in 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So the saints that are alive when Christ return are going to be given a reward, but not before those saints that have already died, that are falling asleep. For the Lord himself would ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So that goes all the way to verse 18. And I didn't keep that going while I was going, but anyway... Um, so the reason I wanted to read this passage because this is almost quoted uh, Paul again in our next uh, passage which is 1 Corinthians 15 but it really get, was very specific about the timing so I like that it mentioned the trumpets when the trumpet of God sounds the dead in Christ rise first and then those who are living uh, are, are resurrected and changed uh, but it did not actually mention the word change and did not actually mention what we were changing into. So that's why our second passage is 1 Corinthians 15. Now the entire chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, is called the resurrection chapter. We do not have time to go through that. That can be your weekly, that can be a, another thing that you go in 
dig into the word this week and read this entire chapter. I'm going to skip down to verse 50. Because this tells about what type of change is going to occur. So 1 Corinthians 15.50, Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. So once again, the timing here is exactly as it is in 1 Thessalonians. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. So we will no longer be flesh and blood that decompose and go back to dust. We are going to be raised into an incorruptible spirit. From this verse, we'll see that there's going to be a spiritual resurrection, not like the physical resurrections that we've seen in the past, but a spiritual one like the one that Jesus Christ had as the firstborn. We picture this every year at the Feast of Trumpets. Let's turn to the, our final passage, which is Revelation 20. <clears throat> so if somebody comes to you and asks you about the hope that lies within you, you can tell them 1 Corinthians 15, and you can tell them Revelation 20. Revelation 20, and I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, this is verse 4, catch up. And they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them, then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of the Lord, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So all of the saints that have ever lived, all the saints that are living now, and all the saints that have lived or died through the tribulation up until the time of Christ, which is the day of trumpets, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. In verse 5, I'm actually going to skip the first part of verse 5 and just read the second part of verse 5, where it says this is the first resurrection. So talking about all of those people that I just mentioned, they're going to be resurrected at that trumpet when Christ returns, and that is the first resurrection. Verse 6 says, Blessed and holy with those who have part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Physical beings cannot live a thousand years, right? So this is going to be this first resurrection is that spiritual resurrection that Paul described into eternal life. They're going to be reigning and ruling. This first resurrection is a great resurrection. It's described in Hebrews 11 as a better promise. It also, just reading the passage, because this says the first resurrection, there should be another one, right? There's got to be something else that goes along. And plus the fact, this really wasn't the first resurrection. Christ was actually the first resurrection. But they're talking about, okay, in this time period, there's something that comes next. So let's take a look at some more verses. As we start talking about the next resurrection, which we'll go ahead and call the second resurrection, we can tell three things. Three things are going to be very clear from Scripture. Who's in it? We're going to know who's, who that is. We're going to know when it is. And we're going to know what type of resurrection. Okay, so let's take a look. We just need to move into verse, uh, we're going to go back to verse 5, which I don't know. Do I have it here? Nope. Let's go back this way. Um, so I don't have it up here. Uh, verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So... Let's see, who would be included in the rest of the dead? <laughs> Sounds like everybody. <laughs> so who was in the first resurrection? The saints. Who's in the second resurrection? The rest of the dead. That's what scripture tells us. It also says when it's going to happen. After the thousand years are over. 
We also know, we're going to continue on in the next verse, uh, not, not verse 7, we're going to skip down. Um, we know that it's a physical resurrection. So we know who, when, and what. We know who, when, and what. You know, this is a big deal. That there's going to be a resurrection for everybody. Once again, this dispels the falsehood that today's the only day of salvation. These people are going to be raised up and given another chance. Well, actually, no, it's not another chance. It's actually their first chance. All those people that we talked about that never heard the name of Jesus. They, the rest of the dead, are going to be raised. Our God is a just and fair God. He is one that wants to give everybody a chance. And so, and, and isn't this going to be marvelous? They will, because this is happening after the millennium, they will be able to look back and see history. Now, we did skip some verses there where Satan's going to come up, and there's going to be a war. We skipped that. But they're going to know that. These, this, the people in the second resurrection are going to be given history. They're going to say, hey, look, for a thousand years, God's way worked. And then for a short period of time, Satan was released. And when mankind does what they want to do and they rebel against God, it leads to only destruction. And they're going to be given a choice. And it's a matter of life and death. Let's turn to verse 11. <coughs> Verse 11. You need to skip ahead. And then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on him, in whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, <clears throat> and from whose face the earth and heaven flew, uh, fled away. And there was no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. Our literature, our church literature, speculates that this could be the books of the Bible. Because they're going to be taught. They're going to be taught. They're, being, they're resurrected, they're physical, they're going to be taught from the Bible. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the je dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Is there anyone else? Is there any other group? There's one group of people that I have not mentioned. And, you know, from this point, it gets fuzzy. Our church teachings say that there's three resurrections. Um, discussing this with Mr. Smith um, a couple of weeks ago, I then went to listen to one of Mr. Petty, Gary Petty's sermons. You know, maybe another word for this instead of a third resurrection, maybe we could call this a, another category. There is another category of people. And that is people that did have God's word. These were people that were taught, they were called, at some point maybe even converted, but then rejected it. There is a group of people that just feel that they know more than God and that their way is better than God's way. And they've rebelled and they've rejected God. So this third category of resurrection is also a resurrection to physical life. And it may actually have happened at the same time where we just read in verse 6 where it says the rest of the dead are raised. Could be at the exact same time. But they're going to be raised so that they will be forced, every knee will bow to Jesus Christ. They will be forced to admit that he died for them and that they rejected him. And then they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Let's read that in verse 13. By the way, a companion scripture to this, uh, to this section is Ezekiel 37. Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each according to his works. Verse 14, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So at this point, everything has, everyone and everything, even death, has been judged. And God has at this point picked who's going to be in his kingdom. 
Verse 15, And anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. My final pie chart. You know, I really would want this to be a complete circle. Everything in white. So that everybody would be in God's kingdom. But that's not the, what the Bible says. It says that there's going to be some that reject him. And so I've left a little sliver there. I just made that up. I have no wh- idea what the percentage is. Tells me I'm over time. <coughs> well, 35 minutes. For those of us being called today, if we have repented, been baptized, and are allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us into the image of God, today is our day of salvation. We are being called by a righteous judge, and he wants us to have everything that he has. We are just the first harvest. He wants the whole world to be in his family, and he has a plan that includes everyone. One day, somebody's going to ask you what happens after death. Tell them that God has a plan for everybody. And if they want scriptural proof, there's only two, really two passages you need to turn to. 1 Corinthians 15 and Revelation 20. God is setting before us and is setting before all of mankind a choice between life and death. And it is a matter of life and death. Choose life.